Good evening, everyone. It gives us great pleasure to welcome you all to the sixth talk in the lecture series on architectural styles of India on built heritage of Bengal, a crucible of diversity by Dr. Sangamitra Basu. Eastern region of India is the cradle of cross-cultural exchange in the field of art and architecture. The riverine landscape and vast coastal stretches encourage maritime trade in this region since antiquity. Natural and economic resources and water-based transport brought in people from all over the world. The region was also the birthplace of various religious and cultural movements, Buddhism, Jainism, Hindu revival, and Muslim Sufi faiths. During the Sultanate period, which tried to establish a political autonomy, and due to emergence of Bhakti movement, a distinct regional culture and style emerged, which saw its fusion in medieval temples of Bengal. Originating from vernacular huts of rural origin, um, evolved the richly ornamented terracotta temples of Bengal, where classical and vernacular sacred and profane juxtaposed in divergent emerging forms. Opportunities of water-based trade brought in col colonial traders from all over the Europe. Calcutta or Kolkata became the seat of British power. Colonial rule left its own distinguishing marks in neoclassical architecture by the process of hybridization and sometimes by appropriations. Various traits, the hybrid versions of colonial style um, emerged, for example, Indian Art Deco. Kolkata became the birthplace of Bengal Renaissance as well as the nucleus of Indian national movement. The talk covers the evolutionary process of this rich and diverse regional architecture of Bengal. Dr. Sangamitra Basu is a retired professor from, de from the Department of Architecture and Regional Planning in, from IIT Kharagpur. She has over 35 years of experience in teaching, research guidance and consultancy projects in the fields of heritage studies, preservation, architecture, sustainable tourism and GIS application in planning. She has worked extensively on documentation and participatory planning with built and cultural heritage of India and is currently a consultant to the West Bengal government for declaring Kush Bihar as a heritage city. She has served as a member of the National Monuments Authority and is currently serving as a member of bodies like AH Intact Advisory Committee, Heritage Conservation Committee from in the Kol Kolkata Municipal Corporation and Technical Committee of the Victoria Memorial Hall, Kolkata. She has authored over 60 technical articles in various publications, journals and has presented papers in international and national conferences. She has also organized several training programs like online course on historic preservation as a part of NPTEL in Swayam platform and was host faculty coordinator of courses on heritage management and heritage and disaster management under GIAN supported by MHRD. Dr. Basu is the coordinator of National Scientific Committee on Historic Towns and Villages, ICOMOS, India. I would like to call Mr. Rajat Ray on stage to talk about the architectural science project. I hope you all have a great evening. Thank you. Please remember whatever has been talked about, Sangamitra. So, uh, I think uh, some of you at least have been present in the previous few lectures. So, this is a series. This is a series of lectures. Today is the sixth lecture of uh, five more has happened. So these are part of a larger project that uh, Intact Age Division has taken up. This project is actually a project of creating a database, uh, basic information base on various kinds of architecture in various parts of India with heritage as a uh, sort of a, a perspective, but it is exhaustive study. Now the idea is to make information regarding these various kinds of architecture accessible to first target is common people, very, very lay person in that sense, who can through a accessible web based portal, almost like Wikipedia or a search engine, know, get to know about different kinds of buildings, different kind of architecture that has happened in the country. That same database can be also used by researchers at the graduate architectural level or by even uh, more uh, and higher level researchers leading up to very specialized searches leading to almost doctoral studies also. So this is that attempt. What it does is it is surveying uh, almost the whole country. It sounds very ambitious but still that is the objective to enlist and identify buildings and to do that we have set up a very basic simple uh, framework or platform where this is organized 
And for that, we have taken uh, three, uh, we divided the whole thing into three main parts. We are talking about architecture, which belongs to nature, very close to nature, which in other words is vernacular. <coughs> then architecture, which is traditional. Uh, often there is a confusion between vernacular and traditional, but we call nature. Next is culture. And we have a third part, which is we call now idea, which are more formed ideas. Now, I cannot explain all that right now. But also, this, each of them, we are laying out along a, on a matrix where different geoclimatic zones of India are identified. And we are trying to see what are the kinds of buildings that happen in climatic zones. Because most certainly, the climatic zones also supply the material uh, that comes from that place and that is utilized in buildings. And we are identifying or talking about basic functional building types like houses or churches or religious buildings that are seen across all these zones. So that gives us a platform. One part of the project is to have these lectures where we tie or connect with the people who are extensively researching on these areas and they have their own experience to share. And we draw from these lectures to connect into our system. Our objective also is to connect to the institutions who are working in these areas, educational and non-educational, and also create a bibliographical base of information as a comprehensive thing. It is a very ongoing, long project. So thank you very much for coming here. I just uh, try to uh, attention, draw your attention to those who have been coming for two, three. This, for example, we would place in a, in a gray zone between culture and idea, not vernacular, as far as we are looking at it, not nature. So that, that's just an indication of what the way we're talking about. But anyway, the lecture is rich in itself, so please. Uh. Thank you. Uh, warm welcome to all of you. And, uh, and thank you for inviting uh, me and Tag uh, to, for this lecture. When a uh, few months back, when I was requested to give this lecture, I said, this is the topic I can talk about. But I also said simultaneously, this is a topic a lot of work has already been done. So I said, people know about it. But they told me that not many people know. So I'm, I agree that it's not my work. It's a sort of a compilation. And I'm very bad in referencing. It's not an excuse for an academician. But I haven't been able to do that. But it's a lot of work has been done, some of which I'll mention. Uh, and it's uh, very good that. Uh, Professor Roy has mentioned that how the classification is being done. So through the lecture, I, will, I sometimes feel at a loss that how to really classify and how to differentiate between nature and uh, vernacular or cultural. And this is something which is a topic very close to my, my uh, mind and uh, I, uh, heart, and I'll share whatever I know about this. Now, I said built heritage of Bengal, a crucible of diversity. But I also like to add, was it in search of an identity? Uh, this is a question I start this lecture with. Now, when I talk about Bengal, I'm not only talking about the Bengal, what we know today, which is West Bengal. Uh, these are some of the areas of Bengal. It's by Bangladesh, Bihar, and other things, because if you don't understand the historical and geographical context and also the natural context, to talk about architecture style is not possible because uh, I'll talk to that later. This is actually this region, which is both what we know as Bangladesh today, which is East Bengal and the West Bengal, and combine that. And again, a much larger to that. I'll bring some of the examples from there. Because culturally, these two Bengals are same. Uh, and uh, many of the things what we share and manifestation of a common cultural lineage. Basically, it's a Ganges Brahmaputra Delta, where, which includes the modern day Bangladesh, Indian state of West Bengal, Tripura, Assam, Borak Valley, and located in the eastern part of Indian subcontinent at the apex of Bay of Bengal and dominated by fertile Ganges Velta. These natural phenomena, that Himalayan at the top, the Bay of Bengal, and the coastal, vast coastal area, and Shundarvan, which is shared by both Bangladesh and West Bengal, 
and, uh, and so many rivers. This is actually what has been responsible to evolve, continuously evolve the architecture what we see in that region. And it's also, as I say, Assam, because it's not only Assam, it's also Bihar, Orissa, which also at one point of time was politically, the Bengal province was a part of that. And that really played a very important role to evolve the architectural style of that area. You see that this is basically a riverine area multiple estuaries, rivers coming from the Brahmaputra, Meghna, Padda, Ganges, the entire tributaries and that. So these riverine landscape actually not only has been responsible for the architecture, it actually dominates the life of people there. Their fishy culture is the most important thing, the water, and the harvest is a lot. It also is a cause of disaster, flood, and uh, storm, and uh, boating. There are so many work has been done on the different types of boats, that area. And this is the area where it dictates the life of the people. It has been dictating the life and the culture of the people who has been staying in this area since antiquity. And uh, as I say, since antiquity, it has been known, I mean, since a long time uh, that there were people in that area. They even in Ptolemy's map also that this is known, and the map is shown, this riverbed, and Gangari Dai, that is that area which is mentioned in the Greek things. And it, they mention that as a seat of the military power. And one Chandruki Tugor, which is there near Calcutta, which has been partially excavated by the side, they say that it was a large, it's still a lot to be explored and other things, that this was the seat of the maritime trade, which is one of the major reasons for the flourishing of that area economically. Ancient Bengal uh, was divided into basically various regions. Of these Ras and Banga, there were also Samtata, Pundra, the Anga, so a larger area is there. But of these two major regions, I would like to uh, take your attention to one is Banga, one is the Ras. They are naturally different. Banga is a basically the Barendra area, which now is the Bangladesh, and Rar is the the laterite soil, the more of the red area. And these actually will see that how it has provided the basic material of what is the architecture is been built on. And uh, as I say, the it's in long time, it has been the colonies of Southeast Asia and the Indian Ocean. And we know that, that uh, from the various Puranas that the Sri Lanka Vijay, King Vijay, was actually he went from Bengal, that's what Purana says, that Vijay, and this is the thing. So these are the various parts. So we have to, when we talk about Bengal and its architecture, we have to come out of that political, geopolitical, political boundary what we see today. Until and unless we understand that, it can never be seen that how the dynamic evolution process of architecture has happened. And this is a terracotta plaque in one of the village areas. There are numerous terracotta temples. We know of Bishnupur, but there are so many of them. It's a small plaque that where that maritime, uh, the journey has been recorded. Uh, but if we go back to a uh, long period, that it was also the seat of two major religion movements. One is Buddhism, another is Jainism. And these actually, so, what we see the terracotta temples of Bengal, Bishnupur, we know we actually there was a far behind uh, a lot of legacy of that area. Uh, in the Barendra area, we know the Buddhist monastic complex, Mahajana Buddhism, which flourished in the Palo time. Bikramshila was the capital of that region, and there was the Patish Dipankar, his major uh, monastery was there, and it was made of brick. That's uh, why I'm bringing that. The stone is very scarce there. It's not 
is in other India and other parts of India. So big, because it's an alluvial soil and it's the major source of the material, the burnt clay. And we have a numerous examples in prehistoric uh, historic time that how that Buddhist monasteries were done with the brick. And even in North Bengal today, the ASI is excavating more and more brick buildings, a very fine, different uh, sizes of the brick without any mortar, but they are there intact. So we had a lineage of terracotta or burnt clay bricks from that time. And as you see the rivers, that the river became a major source of travel. And uh, we also saw uh, Jainism, which flourished in this region. And as they proceeded, there were uh, remarkable uh, temples which were there. Many of them has been later converted, we know, in Odisha or else in Bengal. Uh, the, I've been spending in Kharagpur, just next to us were one place called Jin Shahar and where the Jain were there, Jain, and just recently on the Kongshabuti river bed, they have found more and more remains of the Jin Shahar. So there were the Jain and the Buddhism, these two religious uh, flourishing, uh, religious movements flourished there. And as we see that uh, these temples which we see in there, uh, they are actually um, some of them were in the laterite stone. These urn examples of a laterite stone in the Ra region. And as you can see that the influence of it is strongly from Odisha. Because as I say that it's not Bengal as I say, say it was an, at a one point of time, even during the Nawab of Bengal and uh, even British time, the Bengal Bihar Odisha was one Pargana. So it was there. And so there was a lot of this interaction and influence of that we see the clear uh, influence of the Orissa and classical architecture. Uh, so when we see the influence of Orissa, I'm not really going very much on the timeline-wise. Uh, these are the examples which were near Bakura, in the near Bishnupur, which is a tentative world heritage site known for its terracotta temples. Uh, very near to that, we still have this stone uh, temples which are strong influence of the Orison. They are built with the laterite stone. They are three ratha, that means three tired offset projection plan and simple moldings with offset vaulting roof and crowned with an amlaka. So these were already there uh, when the, the later movement flourished. And they are very, they are all over in that region uh, in the laterite. They are strongly laterite dry area. Uh, so this is an example. Now the examples which are shown in the last two slides, they are of laterite stone. This particular example of the style-wise or form-wise, they are same, but meant with brick. This is Shiddhishara Shiva temple, is a Bakura, and it is again a Rekha Deul, which is from the Pala and the medieval period. Plal dynasty was one of the very important dynasty in the history of Bengal at that time, and the Pala uh, dynasty is not only confined, it's a larger part of eastern India, uh, it flourished. Uh, I, uh, just to show there, because oh, if you see all over India, the examples of terracotta temples are not many. This is Sripur, uh, near Raipur, uh, Sripur where is the Lakhan temple, which are of the ter terracotta temples, almost the same form. So it almost flourished, so we see that how it transcended the geographical boundary and maybe a common influence was there. Now, so this is we're talking about the geopolitical, how it grew in the Buddhist, the Jainism, how classical Orison architecture influenced there. So this is the what we call a classical architecture. But what is also very interesting happened, that's why I have some, uh, sometimes an issue with this strong classification, is the vernacular architecture. The vernacular architecture which happened there is basically a very rational depending on the nature and the climatology of that area. So what is the climate? A lot of alluvial soil and heavy rainfall and uh, very agrarian. You don't have to just work. Uh, earlier time it was said that you just have to spread the seeds and it grows. And uh, so thatch, mud, these are available there. So we have vernacular wise 
the forms, the traditional Bengali heart, they were classified or can be categorized under two types. One is the chala type, I'm just sticking that, the bamboo thatch and the clay, they were the major material for, and even now you can find that. So there were two types of those thatch rows. One was ek chala and another was char chala. So if it's ek chala, that means it's rectangular in plan, it's a humped roof because bamboo can be made, it's a projected thatch roof which comes from the byproduct of the agriculture and it's very good for taking away the rainwater so, and it is uh, rectangular in plan. And char chala is actually square in plan. So you can have char chala for a single story, art chala when it goes to double storied. So you have a center room surrounded by the veranda, which is in this climate is a very climate responsive, rational type of design. So this char chala and ek chala were the basic vernacular forms of the uh, based with the things uh, and you see the humped roof which is there and so uh, based on these vernacular form the temple times evolve they evolved in more permanent material so if you see the form it came from the vernacular art form but it was absorbed or translated into more permanent material terracotta, stone and others. So there is a reason probably behind that. You can see this is a Vishnupur temple which is you see the translation of a vernacular form with the permanent material which is lime concrete, coastal area. So lime concrete was available which came with, uh, there is a history why it came and there were pointed arches and why did it come and when did it come. So the one is that Chala temple based on that hump troop and another is the uh, Chala temple which is of the square base and there can be many tiers of that. So this is an example of the Radha Vinod which is based on this. So if you can see the plan there can be one room and surrounded by veranda on walls side or four sides or this and that. Now we see that this was not there. If you go back to history, we see the Jain Buddhist temples in the uh, big, uh, there were examples of timber architecture which don't survive. There are examples of that during the Pala period and other. But what happened is that Bengal, during the Bengal Sultanate, which is 14, 15, and 16 centuries, uh, we see these forms. The, that was in the North Bengal, Malda region, and where there is a curved kernel and the so what happened when the the Bengal Sultanate came and they formed something a translation of the uh, uh, vernacular form in the material in a more permanent material but why why they took that form it is logical because curved kernel gives a protection for sloping away the rainwater and it is a alluvial salt, you cannot go very high up, so it's a spreaded area. So minars were never uh, very long, they were short, stout mirror, and that's where, and the con uh, lime, lime was available as a sort of a concrete because of the shell, burning the shell, lime was available. So sultanas, they brought what we know, the uh, vaulted system or arcuated system of construction, which was not there. It was basically a trabulated system of construction. So a vernacular form translated into a material which was available here with the construction technique which was imported or brought by the arch system of construction and gave this shape. So it was logical to have that. There are numerous examples, both Bengal, they are of these types of tombs and structures or which are shallow, uh, broad base, not very high, uh, stout corners. Uh, this is the time, the Sultanate time, the Bhakti period, the Hussein Sahi dynasty, another major in incident happened, which is the Chaitanya's movement, which is the Bhakti movement. It was more than a Bhakti movement because it was more a socio-cultural movement, a social movement, which uh, taking away to all the barrier of the class and other things, bringing that thing. So this is mostly a social reformer. And when he did that, there was a, a connection to the Puri and the Puri pilgrimage was always happening, so it's a rank. And that really 
either by plan or the by consciously gave a sort of temple form which was very similar to the Mughal tombs and what we saw, but temples with terracotta, mostly sometimes with laterite, very, very uh, uh, smaller area, but temples. There was a difference between the two. Construction te technique is the vaulted arcuated system with lime, concrete lime mortar and others sloping projected roof, which was very logical for the, this type of climate. But the difference is that when it was in a mosque, there was no ornamentation outside. When it was temple, there were panels of ornamentation depicting the Puranas and other things because it was allowed. But who did that? It was done by both the Hindu and the Muslims as a craftsman. And they were interacting with each other and to bring this innovation with the art form. There was no barrier religion-wise, no barrier or other thing. It was almost an experimentation, innovation going on to give permanence to the temple or a religious structure and expression of the manifestation of the bhakti movement of the temple, which is all over there. When, if you see closely to this temple structure, one of the terracotta tiles, burnt terracotta tiles with a profuse decoration. Another was pointed arches, multifoil arches, sloping roof. So there was no, even in a temple, there was no thing that this is from that religion, this is from that religion, because it was a product of the craftsmen who really were not uh, this thing, it was brought. And also, politically probably, it was also Bengal as a, establishing a regional identity away from the Delhi. So they were trying to form an identity of them and architecture is always a manifestation of what the people think, what the people want to express. And it was encouraged by the local chieftains and other because as a region, they wanted to establish an identity different from Delhi, a regional identity where Baruhiyas, the Jamindas, Hindu, Muslims, all were there fighting for the regional identity. And that was probably a manifested into a very, and also as I say, climatologically, material wise, this is more logical or rational to have that. Civil Hindu state established, so this is the Baruhiyas of Bengal, I say. Uh, it, as I say, both the Bengals and the larger areas established in and around Bengal during the medieval period. There are extensive land reclamation in the forested and marshy areas. Uh, there was a trade, so it was a very golden age. Introduction of new music. Architecture is not alone. It is a reflection of a society from all forms of culture. Uh, architecture is just one form of culture. So it was in music, it was in literature, it was um, in paintings, it was scroll paintings. In all form, these two uh, religious uh, people, they were interacting with each other. And even now, there is a Potuchitra, the scroll painting in Bengal. I mean, I was tempted to bring one of that. And there, it was traditionally the Ramans, Mahavarans are being the folklore, but the singers and the potuas all from the Muslim things. And even today, they're just changing the topic now from they are talking about age, they're talking about environment, but there, there is no bar. And that's, why I think, the very uniqueness that what flourished in this region. Military, because it was a coastal region and so rich, Portuguese started coming and they were followed by various other, Bombete and other things. So Maharaj Pritabaditya of Jashur and Bardhaman Raja, Raja Krishna Chandurai and Malabhan King, which was a start, right in the Ra region, away from the coastal, a very dry region. These were the principality which really sort of helped to the sponsor, they patronize the various art form and also architecture. Bishnupur, though they are all over Bengal in both the Bengals, but Bishnupur is the climax or a culmination of this culture because the kings there, there is a lot of myths how uh, they came from Rajasthan and other things. I'm not going to the detail, but one of the kings became a uh, bhakti movement. So the that Chaitanya and Krishna Lila and other things became very important part there. And 
this is one of the, uh, some of the structure, quite a few structures are still there. Uh, and this is Vishnupur is, why is a tentative world heritage site? Because at one place, all forms of many, various forms of temples, both terracotta, laterite, and multiple forms of Chala and Ratna temples are there in one place, in and around there. And that's why is the significance uniqueness. Now, this is Rashmon show of Vishnupur. This is the conjectural plan, how the palace was there. Rashmon show, again, Rashmon show is a very, very unique thing of Bengal because Rash, during the Rash time, the Krishna comes out, there may be in other regions, I don't know, the Krishna comes out and is, be there for, and idols from all the families come out. So as if the God comes out and interacts with the community for this state, and so is the is a public domain. There is no barrier that who can go inside the temple or not temple, so it's still there. And all over Bengal, this Rash Mansha are very unique. The the Rashmancha of Vishnupur is an unique. There is no other I have seen this Rashmancha. It's a pyramidical roof and other. Even few years back also, the oh, entire city, the town, all the idols were being brought there for celebrating Rash. Now, there evolved, as I say, a combination of Chala and Ratna temple. I say Chala and Ratna temple, one is an elongated plan, another is the square plan. But on the top of that, there is no logic for that, was the Ratnas, the Shikharas, which were influenced from the Orissa. So a vernacular form translated into two Vesic types, and then there were the Ratnas, which were Shikara, exactly into the Orissan style of architecture. And these Ratnas, there, it is actually going to the Garbhagriya, is there are multiple manifestation or typologies of that. There can be one Ratna, Eka Ratna, there can be Pancha Ratna, there can be 16 ranches, there can be 18 ranches. So as the tar goes up, there are so many Ratnas, and these Ratnas, also also uh, of can be of a varied type. So I'm just quickly show that. And this is again something in unique Jor Bangla. Now this is, I, I have never been able to understand why the Jor Bangla was evolved. Because if you see from outside, it is two in structure, two elongated structure. But if you see the planet is square, because that is, the, is significant for the religious shape. So why two elongated structures were joined together and put into a Jor Bangla and on the top there was a pinnacle which is again Bengal type. I still have asked many people but I don't know what is the reason for that. This is how it goes that it, 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 there's no logic. Until and unless somebody was experimenting and trying to be innovative and do something with the forms and this is the only thing how a culture evolves and explores by innovation, experimentation and other. So Jor Bangla is there in Vishnupur. There are many other places in Bangladesh, but this is again a unique form and Jor Bangla of Vishnupur is very well known. And this is, you see, High Plain and the Terracotta. So uh, this I have taken from Orunabu, who is again, uh, so, so this is a classification. Now before going to the classification, there David McHitchin has done an elaborate classification of these temple types of Bengal, late medieval types of Bengal. And it's even it is to look at his classification that by the form wise and taking the examples, uh, how strictly and formally he has classified according to the form, the plan and other thing is something very remarkable at. Um, he went to the interior places, he was a professor in Jadapur University, he with a cycle went into uh, interior places and documented and he uh, passed away very young and uh, his documentation is still something anybody interested in. I became in conservation especially when I was a student, I went through that. And so he, he done an extensive classification of the late medieval temples which they are known as. So these are the Chala temples. As you can see, there are multiple options which are possible. Now also we are talking about one region. This is also the form which later became Bangladar because Man Singh and other when they came, they took that form and it became Bangladar in Rajasthan and other. It is known as Bangladar. 
and there are, even in Lahore, this one and other Jaisalmer, that Bangladesh form came. So there was no reason for that to be in Rajasthan, but it is how a form transported there from one region to another and adopted and given a unique form or temple style. Uh, this is some of the examples, like this is a Pancharatna temple, this is the Ekaratna, and you just see that there is proportion is varying, the, uh, how the regions are happening, they are varying, so there are so many experimentation uh, going on there. And so, fusion with the Latina Shekhara, which is common in Orissan temples have been taken up there. This is up to the late medieval times. Later on we'll see when the colonial influence come, they were also being influenced by the Portuguese and other things so that Chala was saying. So this is what is, I think, culture. Culture is never frozen. It is continuously evolving, innovative, experimenting and other within a certain format. So these are the Ratna temples. There are, as I say, if I say, Mackichin's book, there are hundred, more than hundred classification. There's only few that were the Ratna and Chala temple, I say Pancharatna and other things. So there, I've seen in a small village, there can be 18 towers also. And some of them are uh, uh, this thing. And some of them in very bad shape. And these are that how the Orissan style. So there is something which evolved of vernacular culture, of nature, material, uh, political, socio-political, economic situation, reason for identity, vernacular cross thing with the uh, other acquitted form, evolve something, taken something from Orissa, went outside. This is something so mesmerizing that how it is spreading and taking and being adopted. And these are still there. This is Vishnupur that the profuse terracotta burned. Now, when the clay is burned, it's because that laterite soil, it takes a very, very high uh, uh, sort of uh, this crystal, glass crystal, there is very water resistant, so they become very hard. And there, the depiction, this is the Rashlila, which is being depicted in one of the Vishnupur temples. So there are variety. These are all from Vishnupur, but they are common anywhere, everywhere. Now also, as I say, that it's not only architecture. If a culture evolves, it is manifested in all form. This is Baluchuri. Baluchuri, the Baluchur village is in Mushidabad. The Mushidabad Nabab time, he brought the craftsmen from Benares to weave the saris in the same Benares weave to depict for the the begums of the court. So there is a village called Baluchur near Mushidabad. In Balu Bishnupur, because of the patronage later on, uh, there was a craft weaving technique, normal weaving. Uh, two people, Akshay Kumar uh, and Shubhutakur, they brought those craftsmen or the weavers from Baluchur village and settled them here in Bishnupur. And that only what changed? The theme changed. The crafts, the technique remained same. Theme here became Rashlila, another thing, which gave to the Baluchuri Saris. So how is, I mean, it is uh, really evolving and is still one of the very exquisite. And, this, uh, and also what is happening, what we can see that if the terracotta plaques, this can be anywhere, that how on the murals or the decoration, how the dresses, the Mughal dresses, Mughal turbans, they are being, uh, they are there. So there is, there is no bar that what dress or whatever is wearing. What is the society is there? That is getting reflected and the craftsmen have a freedom to depict that in uh, their architecture and the decoration. And what is important, I said, Vishnupur is a principally a Vaishnavite culture, but there the Shakto iconography there on the temples. And there, so there is no that we are regional conservatism, uh, religious conservatism with there. But not only uh, saris or weaving, not only the temple, there are various other forms, Dashabhatatta, 
this all came from the tribal region. It's surrounded by the tribal region, the horses, the Vishnupur horse and Bakura horses. These are all their formations. So various art forms which the and it all happened due to the patronage of the Malla kings, and it's still there, which is flourishing. What is also interesting, as I talked about the regional identity, the Sufi and the Baus, principally they are the same in philosophy, and they sort of interacted, and they sort of, there was a lot of examples that one wrote the poems for other and other things. So these, they are something a philosophical, religious thing which flourished in this time of the Sufis and Bowels. And this is an example that how a temple, that floral arch or the multifoil arch of uh, different other things came and being uh, uh, adopted there. Now, technique wise, there is uh, still that I just brought that, the construction technique, it is with lime. So lime based, so there, there are still some formula there, they use urad dal, they use methi or fenugreek, they use the gur or molasses, and for each one of them, there is a ace, I still follows that. There is a reason for that, because something is anti-pesticide, uh, something for coagulating and other things. So this traditional uh, to form the lime was basically, and lime terracing, when we are young, we saw the lime terracing on the roofs. It was a very good waterproofing treatment. So the lime and lime based thing, construction take are still there. Now, as I say, this is one of the old British paintings where uh, that which is not there, that the ports which developed along the coast and the rivers which were there. I brought this from Mukulde's thinking. This is uh, Ramshita. This is Ramshita in the mural, but the dress is definitely um, on another region and other things. So they, as I say, that there was no bar, uh, there was no conservatism in how they will trap the things. So we'll see more. Now, I've just bring some slides to show a comparison between the same thing which happens in today's Bengal, West Bengal, and Bangladesh. So they are the some things which is there. Sonar, Sonargao, it is near Dhaka, which is a very flourishing port, and Trade Center, and this is Faridpur, Bangladesh. This is Temple of the Chai Ghosh Deul in West Bengal, just to show the similarity. This is Jor Bangla Temple, here, Narayan. This is Pushi Medinipur. They are all, they are not in Vishnupur, they are all over in the small, small villages. They are languishing. They are, many of them are private properties. Uh, Malvika insisted, and I did a project for unlisted uh, heritage structure. I knew how pitiful conditions they are, but people are very proud of their heritage. And also the colonial elephants, because many colonial elephants, this is Kuch Bihar, and that is the Faridpur, because the colonial elephants in the meantime started interacting and influencing them. So it was a colonial power which was trying to evolve or put an architectural style which is imported which discontinued this continuous evolving process for power, to show the power. And there a sort of and there also innovation happened. Again, the similarity of the structures. And as I say that this is much later, this is Belurmat, how the Bangladar, which came from Bengal, a translation of a vernacular form came back into the Ramkrishna Belur Mart and adopted there. Who knows from where it is coming? Why who is adopting that? Uh, that is artistic or reason? Or uh, so these are uh, the cultural heritage dynamics. This is put here, and if you see Hongshishwari, which also strong color Portuguese influence, which were there. And as you can see that many of the structures later on adopted the colonial influence, even in Rashmanshu. Uh, this is Hongshishari, which is a very unique type of structure which is there. So there was no bar. This is Ratna, probably. Uh, how you classify that? Which category one will put that in there is a question. So actually, this is my conjecture that built form, whether it is the shelter, space, or settlement system, it is actually a interaction between nature and man. And under natural forces, under the man-made forces, there are exchanges and uh, intervention happens. 
And these are reflected in the different levels of shelter, cluster, and levels, and planning. And these are the attributes where they are reflected. And if you take a timeline, uh, any of these characteristics, either political, social, or anything change, that case reflected into the built form. And this is how uh, culture evolves, and so the architecture style. Uh, the Nawabs of Bengal came very late because there's a Sultanate period and the Nawabs came and for a very short period of time. And uh, this is from the Khartoum Masjid and this is time for 70 years. It was covering both Orissa, Bihar and uh, Bengal, both Bengal. And uh, that is the time, if you see, Portuguese started coming, Chittagong, then Dutch settlements, early English settlements, if you see this area, which is the smaller area, which is called Little Europe, almost all the European countries has a settlement there. This is the first, uh, this is the first unorthodox Greece church, which Greek church, which came. So colonial style of architecture started coming in uh, to the thing. And you see the decorations, that how the gavakho or the window, they depicted this, uh, very, very colonial influence in there, where they are adopting the Venetian blinds in terracotta and other. And as the society and the culture and everything is simple, getting reflected in the decorations of there. And also the European dresses. This is a very, that the women wearing vanity bag, the gowns and other things, not only Calcutta, they are in the small interior villages. This is Patra, which is quite well known, is near Midnapur. If you see, this is Rashmanshu. So if you see the towers of that, it's a strong, it is actually a pickup, and this is a strong Portuguese influence, which was there. And then, because of the colonial influence, as I say, that a class of Bengalis evolved in both Bengal. This is the Babu culture, what we know. They were actually the middlemen or the traders in between the colonial rulers and others. And Potuchitra, this is one. And this is from one of the, uh, one of the Gavak or the decoration from. These are very small places that the, how the window. And what happened is the rich men who were the traders, they, when they accumulated money, they wanted to show their evolve an architecture. What was their architecture? The imitation of the masters of the colonial rulers in the Corinthian army uh, things and other things. So this is some Baliati Jamindar house, clearly that which you see that colonial because they are the set of powers imitating them. The, but this is from outside. But if you look at the plan form, they were still the courtyard base, looking into the courtyard, open to sky spaces, because that is more climate responsive, culturally sensitive for the lifestyle of the people. So there are barandas all around, but only the facade has changed for the Arnic, Doric, and Corinthian. This is the many, many mansions are still there from all over Bengal, many in Calcutta, which are still there. The raw iron used to come from the grills, from, come from England and other things and even the floor tiles. So there are so many, and so many of them, not all are very rich people. There are many, many small houses. Entire northern Calcutta had these courtyard houses, which is a multi-purpose space, logical for the privacy, logical for their. But what happened to the European masters, what they did? Because climatologically, they took this form. When they went to the field visit, they evolved a style which came to be known as Banglu. The Banglu actually is an evolvement of that, the sloping tile roofs, but, our, but that is never imitated in their main form. It was only for the small field trails and other houses, small things. Banglu, which is square in plan, surrounded by the verandas, which is more climatically, and sloping roof, tiles roof. And the Banglu, which was never a mainstream of the colonial rulers, now is a status symbol for all the rich people of Calcutta. We have a Banglu house and, and Banglu's went. So how the Banglu, Bangladar Banglu, it is actually coming, coming from a rationality. And this is from Sheshilaj, which is from Dhaka. So all over Bengal, this happened with ornamentation and other things. This is the courtyard houses. It can be anywhere, but it is from the West Bengal and uh, which is the Thakur Dalan in the courtyard, this Thakur Dalan, the, the Durga, that 
the annual festival used to be celebrated, Kori Barga, they are still there. And this is a mandir. So I, I will ask that this is a residence, this is a mandir. What? This is the Dalan type which came, the flat roof temples. And also what happened came is the different type of decoration because of the lack of patronage. They are now doing the, uh, uh, there is a particular Pongkir Kaj we call it. This is on the lime. They are rich decorations influenced by the Italian type. So they happen there. So the even temples were also flat roof temple or the Dalan type of temple which happened and they have there. And these are the rich decoration which are still there in many of This is the formation and you see the brick formation there in a small, listen, I'm not talking about the major urban areas, I'm talking about small villages and uh, multiple arts and others. So this is the Dalan type of the flat roof. Now if you see uh, the Kinesha temple, which is a combination of uh, Ratna, and flat roof, this is from there. Where we will put them in classification? This is so many, and as David McEachin has said, so many combination possibilities are there. And uh, so this is the bungalow, which I talked about. And this is the courtyards with this uh, wooden Venetian blinds and the courtyard houses, the grills, and this is the, also the time, uh, the spelling is wrong, the Bengal Renaissance was happening because of the Western education system. And there were these families, even Tagore's family, who was initially traded Darukanath Thakur. At one point of time, Tagore, Rabindranath, and his brothers, they burned not only the letters of Darukanath Thakur, they burned or stored, taken away all the furniture of Darukanath Thakur because they wanted to evolve a style or something which is Indian Renaissance. In art, Bengal School of Arts from that time, the furniture, and in Shantaniketan, which is the epitome of this Renaissance which Tagore gave along with his artist, uh, he, I know the Japanese artists working side by side with a temple mason from South India and they were changing the entire inter interior of that. This is Narajol, and which is, they said, the family said, it's very close to Midnapur, again a small, almost a village, the, the wrought iron, which came from this thing, and this is a seat of the nationalistic movement, and they said that Tagore got the, the Shantiniketan structure, which is Shantiniketan structure influence or inspiration from there. And this is Tagore's Shantiniketan. This Ajanta Elora's influence was there, Japanese influence was there. Um, he was evolving a uh, modern, he's almost working along with Frank Lloyd Wright, that thing, Art Nouveau, what we see. He's evolving a uh, modern, with the modern material, which is local as well as local, and taking from the tradition, modernity, and other things. I, I almost parallel Frank Lloyd Wright's architecture and that time, almost they're working almost the same spirit. There's a Japanese garden, but this is a street crossing, which is a notice board there in Shantaniketan. You can see that how he was so free to experiment along with his artists. He brought Chaghor, inspired by the Japanese tea ceremony. He has a Chaghor, Cha Chakro, where he did the paintings on the wall murals, but with the Indian themes inspired by Rajanta. The influence of, uh, influence of Fatifu Sikri is Buddhist, Jainism, Fatifu Sikri, all are there. And, and this is uh, Belur Mot where you see that. So what happened is the cultural influence. Because of the Renaissance, we were also seeing what we know as the Art Deco movement, which happened mostly in India. It was sort of a, not purely what we know Art Deco, it's called Indian Art Deco. There are so many in Southern Calcutta, so there is a movement going on. There's a film, uh, uh, Metro Cinema, Lighthouse, New Empire, all were there. Some European architects also came. So the Art Deco, which is called Indian Art Deco, and which were there and with their side by side, and many of them are getting demolished because of the multi-storied building. So this is the journey. 
the journey which doesn't know any political boundary, no religious boundary, it's not conservative, it's free. It is based on a rationality of the nature. It is based on and uh, unity in diversity. It is reflected in all forms of culture, a culture which is continuously evolving, experimenting, innovating. We can't put a barrier there. And this is something what we call architecture is just a manifestation of this innovative, interesting, experimental journey of culture, nature, and architecture. Thank you. and later on Dalan, and of Dalan, Rotno, and Chala, in this broad categories, there are again multiple subdivisions. So if you, Asiatic Society still has this book on David Michael Chinnis' book and Clive. He really has done a good classification and really going by the examples of that. So branches, sub-branches, this and others from that. Because the base can be something, the tower can be something else. And in the tower, there are so many variations. So he has taken examples from all over, extensively traveled. Many of these are still not existing. And it's a very good book on, on the classification. Chala, David McEachin's Late Medieval Temples of Bengal. What is the time frame of the origin I said that it was vernacular form, the vernacular heart form. It was also influenced by the sultanes who came making the vernacular, the architective system of construction. It was also by classical architecture. I didn't explain that chart, yeah. uh, but it was also a fusion of the uh, classical uh, architecture. So it was all, because that's how, that was the region and the material which was available, the climatological in nature. So I have a question that how we can separate the nature and the culture and uh, the architecture. I, and, uh, in Bengal here, I really at a loss. If somebody wants me to sort of classify, I really don't know what is vernacular, what is classical. It was such a, and I'm sure I know Bengal a little bit, but uh, I'm sure that it happened all over India. It is a diversity, pluralism, which is the central theme. And there was no bar. And a culture is something which is never frozen. It is something which is continuously evolving, experimenting. Otherwise, I don't see any reason from your Bangla to come. It was irrational. Um, Ma'am? Uh, yes. Uh, uh, I, you can ask me a question? Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, this technology, this terracotta technology, uh, this is very indigenous to Bengal, or is it found in any other part of? Uh, I see it. Uh, I saw it in uh, that uh, Sipu. Uh, no, and it was all in, in that same region, right? Sipu is in the uh, Chhattisgarh. Ah, but Chhattisgarh, okay, Chhattisgarh. eastern part. Eastern. No, what I'm saying, eastern, eastern. asking is this. Is this something to do with the nature of the soil? I think the soil, because laterite yeah. soil is very because, good for the laterite yeah, when it's burned at a high yeah. temperature. And any will. other part of the world we find this? Terracotta, yes. Uh, I remember one of our classmates was from Africa. He mm -hmm. brought the terracotta, but not this form, but terracotta. Terracotta is there in many other forms. Mexico but that is the natural. I, I'm sure there are, uh -huh. because terracotta. In but in forms. India, this is this particular technology. India, I see the Nalanda and uh, other things which were there, and we saw the examples. They were there, uh, big things. The whole of uh, Punjab, they don't have terracotta, no. In a different not temple, if you say bricks, 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 but I'm talking about this the decoration technology of uh, decor. I mean, panels. like ter ter terracotta jewelry. Even now, we find only terracotta in uh, jewelry is evolved because of a sort of some experimentation. Yeah, but terracotta, but, but I think that because uh, my conjecture is that because they wanted to have the temple, mm -hmm. and which is logically that aquated time mm -hmm. and the Bengal form mm -hmm. and other thing, and they wanted to depict the Rashtri and ornamentation, which is not allowed in the 
uh, sultanate buildings. They were actually thatched. There was an impression of thatch earth. I didn't explain. The, when the North Bengal, the, uh, uh, this happened, they have given an impression of thatch. Mm -hmm. Not thatch, what you call it, chattai, the splitted mm -hmm. bamboo. Mm -hmm. And yeah. that was the impression. Why yes. that impression would be given on a terracotta? Mm -hmm. uh, so this is something uh, uh, we know architecturally that when one material translates into another material, we go back to the inspiration for the other material. Shachi mm -hmm. stoop is an example mm -hmm. of that. Mm -hmm. So probably there. But I think that... Uh, uh, these uh, under the patronage of the kings and the bhakti movement, they wanted to depict, and uh, this was the material which is available. So they evolved uh, the terracotta, and the laterite soil is very good for that. One of the uh, professor who came, he, he told me that when the glass, it, it, the terracotta, that when it's burnt at a high, the crystal there, mm -hmm. it becomes a very amorphous, and so it's very good mm -hmm. for that burning. And there are again multiple variations of doing that somewhere. You see, the, it, there are just a plaque somewhere in the entire brick is there on the brick face. The terracotta is there, so they are even in laterite temples also there. So also, this Bakula Hall goes up to the archaeological. Yes, period. because it's an indigenous so people. It they have India, that homage that they give that, and from the Pachamura and other things. So still from give the uh, horses. Early uh, 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 early uh, early so because the entire Arabian yeah. world, the Shilabuti, the Midnapur with three rivers. Shilabuti, where a lot of prehistoric uh, remnants are still available. Yeah. Thanks. Professor Kari. Oh. Twenty years back, when I was working on my work on the Bengal temples, we met and uh, we have started working starting from Bihar, as you mentioned in your geographical... Maluti, I didn't yeah. mention Maluti as well. Mm, mm. Mm. And uh, also recent, but very recently, some uh, two months back, I was in Shibasagar, Assam. Yes. And suddenly I see a Jor Bangla there. Shibasagar is uh, Brahmaputra Valley and uh, area between Barak Valley and and one, once you uh, have studied so much about Bengal yeah, temples, and you it. see in Assam a Jor Bangla Ganshab Dol, and then yeah. there are Shiva Dol, uh, uh, all that comes I to your mind. I started with Assam, but I didn't. Yes, when hmm. similarly when I went to Assam, I was fascinated to see the. <laughs> and then Rongghar, which is also a Bengal yeah, covered yeah, roof, and it is a probably largest amphitheater in the in our country yeah. at least. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so, I have mentioned that. Uh, uh, yeah, thank you for including the other parts, but probably no, uh, some. No, yeah, entire hmm. region yeah. that Brahmaputra had. So, you think it went, uh, uh, when I tried to inquire, came to know that it is to do with met patronage and metronage, both. <laughs> Where is it is coming from? Patronage was coming from Assam kings, Ahom kings, but actually they had their metronage coming from Bengal side. So, both in a way contributed architecture is also result of uh, not only culture but also of the patrons and matrons. <laughs> yeah, we are working on Kujbihar and it's very interesting. Okay. Uh, Kujbihar itself, that Koch kings, they were basically Assam and uh, they uh, didn't want to uh, uh, assimilate in the Bengal and now they still some underlying current is yeah. still there of the language. Yes, Thank you. Um, you know, when you trace the uh, conversion of the vernacular, for, uh, vernacular form with mud and thatch on top into this terracotta architecture, um, the uh, original forms had a lot of um, projections beyond the mud walls. And in all of most of these stuff that you have shown here, they, the projections went away and uh, there were no brackets that would support a projection like that, although there was some projection, I don't know how they managed to do that in lime, concrete. It is only much later in some of the things that you've shown that there were brackets that were introduced. And that is the time when this projection started happening. So is there a change of materials there, or these brackets made out of... Uh, I have not seen brackets. Okay. And, uh, you have shown them in some of the work. Here. Yes. Uh, brackets. Yes. Uh, Fredrickson. No, 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 no. I'm talking uh, about. I'm talking uh, about uh, brackets. The brackets is not very common, but yes, uh, structurally, when we are doing restoration of Dokhineshwar Temple, we found a problem. Uh, my colleague, who is a structural engineer, said 
that because this is the sloping because of a form and then on that Pancharatno or Navaratno or whatever is none. So already a structure which is sloping and it is weak and then you put that it is not a flat so you are weakening the structure and still it so there is structurally it does not make sense so, but they were there because of taking away the rain water whatever is there it may not be that much of prediction but the rain water is taken and this a lying thing. But the Krishi temple probably a one problem started that they started having a hidden room and it was cracked and it was going in. We found that where the they put the beam and it was in the most wrong position because it was a very different type of structure already weak and at that point it was inserted for having a hidden floor and the entire thing collapsed, uh, was on the verge of collapsing. So we had to tie down that. But yes, as I say that sometimes in the spirit of innovation, um, structurally and they may not be logical and may not be sound, it is not like a canonical principles where everything is laid out and this thing and that. It was experimentation and there may be some wrong, may not be proper with the experimentation. Uh, so yes, there are, uh, there are issues, there are structural issues and especially with the uh, roof there as you are right that it is, thatch hut was very projected, it was taking away the rainwater, it was form was taken to drain away the rainwater but then what is the logic of having the flat roof? It was an imitation, it's imitation, adaptation, inspiration, mm -hmm. so you know but I think the underlying thing is that it's you always try to do something new, but you're with sound foundation and then this is evolving. That's the branch. I don't know. Yeah, our problems. Yeah, the Dukhinashar temple actually is a Martin Ban construction. It is not a Terakura temple. It is built in Nani, uh, what I say, the form was they took the Navaratna and Dalan, but because there was no understanding of the structure, they, it, they never told us why it happened, but we knew that they actually to make a Garbhagriya hidden chamber, they actually punctured and put the beam inserted at the weakest point. That's the, that's the modern that architectural problem. <laughs> sir, bracket as you are asking, sir, uh, uh, the projection, to me it looks like that projection would be very difficult to do. Therefore, they did not. But I worked on a couple of temples. Uh, they, there are uh, when I did, and all the states are different, by the way. So I did some work in Biru, and the Tarzai said, on the face of the church, so there are small pieces <laughs> like this. But the projection were achieved with lots of cordain offset, lots of offset. So each element has this offset, like a you no. Know, coming out, 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 but each component is built with the offset uh, as a uh, sort of die, almost die, but not like that exactly. So the moldings, uh, several moldings, some are rectangular, some are like that, so if you cut a section, you see going like, like, like that, some are reaching out to create some sort of a projection. And there are some groups, that they don't at all try projection, nominal projection. So projection go which you have. But there are with projections also, and uh, how they tried was uh, it is possible they tried with larger pieces of tile, uh, uh, cast bricks, very few places, larger pieces like Chajja, somewhat like that, and then finished those. But very rare cases, mostly the projection they couldn't have handled. And they stylized the projection at the end also. <laughs> That's the thing. Like in Dokinasha, it's not a Telapuna temple. <laughs> but seeing that, seeing that recently an architect is working in Kolkata, which is very tolerable, or saying that it's very tolerable, he goes on with the lecture. So he has ignored a construction technique, but is using the balance board and giving it to the lecture, and he is going and showing structural characteristics that how it is really going to be constructed, and he is following the lecture. So very difficult to get a country. 
wanted to add a very small addition to the discussion on the on the vernacular form where the, there was a high overhang the high o overhang was a necessity when there are mud walls and the uh, proportion between the the wall surface and the roof surface were almost either equal or the wall all the wall surfaces were small so an overhang would achieve pretty good coverage of the mud from water whereas when it is converted to terracotta the walls actually become much higher and the roof becomes much smaller and there is no need for projection because the brick can sustain even after exposure to water so it's so it's the form which actually evolved from the curvature of the bamboo to begin with but then it gets converted into various forms finally we see all the gurudwaras being built with the same form in concrete uh, everywhere you find concrete imitating that form so that particular form has undergone many transitions but the reason for the projection in the mud wall is a, is a logical thing and when you translate it to brick wall you don't require that projection and therefore it's not there and the walls also become much taller even though they are, then they are exposed to more and more rain so i think it's only logical that they actually go dig away with the projection yeah it was so not it's necessary yeah adjusted between the forms yep so that when you form them together yeah during the you got the projection the small idea it gets a different kind of projection it becomes much sharper and more steeper in the corners so it's there's a it's nuanced culturally it's not simply a logical structure but the, between the mud and the and the terracotta there is no need for a projection in the terracotta uh, so um kapil adi i'm just thanking sir that's all okay um can i request you to stay for one more minute please 
Okay. Okay. <laughs> um, thank you so much, Sangamitra ji, for sharing your views, perspectives, and experiences with us. And um, uh, we have the AH uh, advi advisory committee with us today. So thank you for attending this talk, uh, Benny Kurikos, uh, Mr. Negi, Katie sir, who's our uh, chairperson of the advisory committee. And uh, I'd request uh, Kapila ji, if uh, it's okay with you, uh, she's our founder, one of our founder members. To please give a token of thanks to uh, Sangamitra ji. Thank you. the first time you speak in the end of the <laughs> 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 Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Um, <laughs> Professor Rajitre is our advisor to this project and he introduced it in the beginning. Um, we are very thankful to him to always spare time and uh, uh, Mr. K.T. Ravindran, who always comes for all our talks, uh, which are part of this uh, lecture series from the Architectural Styles Project. And to all of you for staying till the end and uh, coming on a weekday, thank you so much. Uh, if you haven't already put your name on our mailing list, please do that, because we send you invites every time. And um, the next lecture should be in March, and we will send you invites, uh, because this is a monthly series. Um, thank you to admin and maintenance always for backing us and our uh, very competent core team uh, at Architectural Heritage Division, uh, Mithul and Apurva, and uh, our director um, Vijaya is here and our principal director Divya Gupta is here. Thank you so much all of you.